There have been 862 episodes of Doctor Who broadcast to date. My mission, for every single one, say something nice. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Say Something Nice. It's my favourite stripy red shirt, which means it is time for a Season 18 episode. Megloss, Part 1. The opener of this story about a megalomaniacal cactus got 5 million viewers. And while I kind of want to talk about the cactus today, I'm really talking about the performance of actor Christopher Owen, who plays Megloss's human host. Now, it's a bit of a strange role because in the end credits, this character is just called Earthling. He never gets a name. But I really like in this first episode how Christopher Owen both plays him as a panicked Earthman Possibly a little bit informed by Arthur Dent in the Hitchhiker's radio series. Of course, the TV series hadn't happened yet. But towards the end of the episode, when he is transformed into Megloss, he has a really good way of going from that sort of cowering human character into the more confident, spiky-faced, cactus-style character. And we don't see him as Megloss very much. It's mostly Tom Baker in the later episodes. But I feel that he has such a malicious streak in just the few lines he has as Megloss. And a confidence, overconfidence in fact, that we find Megloss has when Tom starts playing him. It's easily a role that an actor, especially when their character isn't even given a name or really much agency or action within the story, it would be very easy for that actor to just kind of go, oh, you know, I'll phone it in a bit. But instead, Christopher Owen, for the few seconds that he is the villain, really gives it a touch of menace. And that is something really nice about Megloss Part 1. It's time for Megloss Part 2. Now, despite Tom Baker's popularity, the sweeping changes made by John Nathan Turner seem to have a slightly detrimental effect on the ratings, but that would be rectified next year. I like Megloss. It's flawed, but it has charm, and I wish Flanagan and McCulloch had written more for the series that actually made it to screen. Of course, they do have a story which was written to be Davison's premiere, but it never got made, sadly. Now, uh, something that happens in this story is that there is a time loop which exists pretty much just to delay the Doctor and Romana arriving on the planet. But it's actually the time loop I'm choosing <laughs> from this episode. They have a brief period before they repeat the time loop where they can actually reflect on what's happening. And I think Tom Baker and Lala Ward both convincingly portray the horror of living through the same moment again and again and being aware of it, understanding what is happening to you. Their solution, look, it feels like pure magic. I don't know how much science is involved. Certainly the script editor, Christopher Hamilton Bidmead, wanted to get away from magical solutions, but the solution of acting through the time loop before you're meant to act through the time loop and canceling out the wave feels a bit like magic. But at the same time, it's believable that that could actually work if you happen to be caught in a time loop, the idea of which feels like magic anyway. And to top it all off, at the end, when the Doctor almost ruins things and just sort of offhandedly says to Romana, oh, you know, you almost stuffed that up, I thought you'd forgotten your lines, the look Lala Ward gives him is incredible. That whole series of scenes between Tom Baker and Lala Ward is something really nice about Megloss Part 2. Today we're travelling back seven years in time to 1980 for Megloss Part 3. I've already talked about Megloss a bit. It's a silly story. It has a cactus who can shapeshift impersonating the Doctor. But today we're talking about different plants. So in this episode, Romana is taken prisoner by the space pirates, I suppose you'd call them, who are serving Megloss space pirates. That idea will never catch on. Anyway, in order to get away from them, she leads them round in circles, and she claims it's because the planet Tigella has an anti-clockwise rotation. Which, you know, wouldn't actually lead them round in circles, but she does it with such conviction, and the captain, General Grugger, doesn't want to look like he's being outsmarted, so he pretends, oh yes, of course I understand that. But the moment I'm choosing in particular is where Romana uses a bunch of carnivorous bell plants to attack the pirates. 
And you know what, it looks a bit silly, but the actors do their best to sell it. And it pays off something that we heard in a previous episode, that the vegetation of Tigella is lush and aggressive, which is a wonderful description. So we have lush aggressive vegetation on this planet, we have a killer cactus on another planet in this system. It's a really nice thing, Doctor Who didn't do killer plants all that often, so you know we had the crinoid a few years before this, but generally it's not something Doctor Who does a lot. It's hard to make look good, and look I think these killer bell plants look fine. I also really like the Vervoids, who I have briefly mentioned before, but yeah, just Romana's ingenuity in that moment and the best direction we could get for this scene in 1980, they're just something really nice about Megloss Part 3. Hello dear viewers, welcome back, and you may have noticed, yes I am wearing the same shirt, it's not because I've forgotten to change it this time, it's because we're covering Megloss Part 4, and I'm just gonna wear this shirt for all of my Season 18 episodes now, because it looks like Tom Scarf! I love this shirt. Anyway, moving on. So, Megloss Part 4, it is the final episode of the story, it's also the shortest episode of Doctor Who ever made, it's like 18 minutes and 20 seconds I think. And they don't even try to have an extra long reprise to, <laughs> to make up for that. But look, what I'm going to choose here is putting Tom Baker up against himself. Throughout this story, Tom has been playing both Doctor and Megloss, and he's really effective as Megloss. In this episode, they come face to face. And it's something irresistible when we have duplicates of the Doctor. It doesn't happen in The Massacre, where William Hartnell is also playing the Abbot of Amboise, it happens very briefly in The Enemy of the World, where Patrick Troughton's playing Salamander. We get a bit of Biffo in The Android Invasion, where Tom Baker is also playing his android duplicate. But here, we get a few satisfying scenes between the two of them when they're locked up. And Tom makes clear performance choices which separate the characters. And those choices are thrown into sharp relief against each other. Despite the fact the planet is about to blow up, the Doctor is quite amused and Megloss is horrified. And Tom Baker has to play both of those things. We have a judicious use of body doubles to cut down on the amount of green screen needed in these scenes. And look, I think that's something that Tom Baker himself would have appreciated. He's on record as not enjoying working with green screens as an actor. He sees the necessity of them in Doctor Who, but especially if you were to look at the behind the scenes footage of Underworld, he's really not happy working in a big green screen environment. And that gives us the added bonus of Tom being able to focus on his performance. And considering that he would have been acting against a double whenever those scenes of the Doctor and Megos together happen, it's even stronger. And that's something really nice about Megloss Part 4. Thank you very much for watching.